be at 2 Kings chapter 20. And let's read verses 1 through 6. You follow along with me and look at, let's look at this. What a, this is a beautiful story. Uh, if, you don't, if you don't ever read in the Old Testament, can, can I just take a little time out? You are missing some beautiful stories and some beautiful illustrations of how God worked through prophets, how he worked through the nation of Israel, how he was always forgiving the nation of Israel. Every time they turned their back on him, he would give them mercy. Every time he'd send a famine to them and they would repent and, oh God, you're our God, he'd always run back to them and receive them once again. And they just, you see this all through the scriptures. Yeah, it's just a big cycle. That's right, Mike. And you just see that, but it's so wonderful. And let me tell you something. If you don't spend some time in the Old Testament, you are missing some great biblical truths in your life. And so I hope you do. I hope you enjoy that. I, and I know some things are genealogy, and, and, and there's a lot of uh, history involved, and, and, and there's a lot of uh, historical facts. I understand that. Just get through it and read it because it'll still feed you anyway. And uh, But there's just some great truths. Now look at verse 1. In those di- days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. That's not real encouraging people, okay? That's just not, that's not good news. You don't want that phone call. You don't want that note on your door. You sure don't want to get that email on your, in your computer. So here comes Isaiah, and he tells him, verse 2, Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. And it came to pass, afore Isaiah was gone out into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again, and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people. Look at that, how he call, now how he calls him that. Thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father. I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord. Verse 6. And I will add unto thy days fifteen years. And I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend this city for mine own sake. And for my servant David's sake. Woo! Isn't that cool? Man, that is awesome! Man, I just love how that story unfolds. And Hezekiah wept sore, prayed to God. Lord, don't take my life. Now, it doesn't say, you know, all that he said. I'm sure that there was more to that. But then the Lord sends word again. And in your handout, of course, this is the story of King Hezekiah. He's the king of Judah. Now, I want you to look at verse 1. It clearly says, thus saith the Lord. You know what that tells me? This was God's decision. God had made a decision. Hezekiah, your life is over. No longer shall you live. You're going to die. This was God's decision, and it was even given through Isaiah. He says, Thou shalt die and not live. But Hezekiah responds with a passionate prayer. I mean, look at it again in verse 2. He says, Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beg thee, beseech, I beg thee, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth, and with a perfect heart, and I have done that which is good in thy sight, And Hezekiah wept sore. You ever been around somebody who started praying? And as they prayed, they just started weeping. And maybe what they were praying, you had no idea uh, necessarily the circumstances of what they were praying. But as they were praying, they just started to weep. You know what? That's precious. It's nothing embarrassing about it. There's nothing awkward about it. 
And I can imagine at this moment, Hezekiah was just as intimate as he could be with his Lord. And he's pouring out his heart to God. And as he's praying, all it says at the end is, And Hezekiah wept sore. I'm sure at the end of his prayer, or maybe he even stopped, it doesn't say. Maybe he just stopped praying and he just started to weep. Maybe he didn't even know how to finish his prayer. Have you ever been to that point in your life where you're not even sure how to pray? Maybe not even sure how I can finish this prayer. I've already poured out my heart to God, and God, you see all things, and I'm pouring myself out to you, and then you just start to weep. That's what Hezekiah did. And you know what? In your handout, how did God respond to his prayer? In your handout, I want you to write this in. God said he would heal him and that he would add 15 years to his life. He said, I'm going to heal you, Hezekiah, and I'm going to add 15 years to your life. Can I be real honest with you? I don't know when my life will end. I I have no idea. The Bible says no man's promise tomorrow. Neither do you. You don't know. But wouldn't you like to be able to pray and add 15 more years if you knew it was the end of your life? Maybe you don't. Maybe you just want to go on and be with Jesus. And I understand that too. But I have to be honest with you folks. I enjoy spending time with my family. I enjoy being on earth because this is God's creation. I enjoy what God's given to me. And I enjoy being here. I don't want to go early. I, 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 I want to I go a certain way when I go. And I want to go before my wife. I don't want to be left without her. And I don't. I want to go first. And uh, I'll, be the, I'll be the most miserable man you've ever met if she goes before me. But I do know this. Hezekiah prayed and he knew he was going to die. And he just wept sore to the Lord. And the Lord said, I'm going to heal you, Hezekiah. And I'm going to give you 15 more years. That's pretty cool. I want you to know from that story alone, you have to see very clearly the life-changing impact of prayer. Had Hezekiah not prayed, what would have happened? Hello? They would be planning a funeral, folks. Okay, ten toes up. Six feet under. Kicked in the can. You know it. You know all the phrases. Okay? Huh? Yep. Yeah, he did right there. DRT. (laughs) But let me tell you something. That's what would happen. But God heard his prayer and responded to it as what he prayed. I love that. I love that. Let me give you another one real quick. Write this in. So that was uh, was 2 Kings chapter 20, uh, verses 1 through 6. Here's the next blank. Write this in for the next story. Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Jonah. Turn in your Bibles to Jonah. And by the way, that is a book in your Bible. It's, not just not about, it's just not a character of the Bible. That's a real book of the Bible. You say, where's Jonah? Well, it's between Obadiah and Micah. <laughs> Did that help you? All right, I'll give you one more help. It's between Amos, Obadiah, Micah, and Nahum. <laughs> Did that help you? All right. Well, I wrote the page down just so I could find it a whole lot faster. If you don't know... Just look in the front of your Bible and look it up. That's why they put it there. All right? It's just not cheating. You can't cheat in the Word of God. All right? I'd rather you get there. So Jonah chapter 3. I'll give you just a minute to get there. I love the book of Jonah. I do. I mean, here is a guy, and I don't want to get ahead of the story, but here's a guy Man, the Lord's just using and wanting to use, and this guy runs the other way. I mean, this this guy is so much like me. I mean, you know, I can remember my life, and and man, just God tugging on my life, and just vividly telling me what I need to do, and, and telling me in my heart, and the Spirit inside me knew what I should. And man, I I put on my running shoes. I couldn't run fast enough from what God was wanting me to do. Well, if he said go left, I went right, you know? And uh, if he said go straight, I, I, I went, I curved. I mean, I was just like Jonah. And, and this is Jonah and the story of him. 
and God told him to go to the wicked city of Nineveh and you set them in order. You tell them that judgment's coming and you tell them to repent and I'll withhold my judgment. And it's kind of interesting. Look at Jonah chapter 3 and hope you wrote that in your blank there. And look at uh, verses 1 through 10. It's a short chapter, but so much is in there. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go into Nineveh, the great city, or that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. And that's interesting. Hey, don't preach what you want to preach. Preach what God gives you to preach. Amen? That's a great story for a lot of preachers or a great uh, example what they should be doing. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put a sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh and he rose from his throne. And he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. Let not man and beast be covered with sackcloth, or, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. And cry mightily unto God, yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he said that he would do unto them and he did it not. I love this story. God's decision was to destroy Nineveh in 40 days, according to verses 1 through 4. God was going to destroy them. Now, I don't know about you, but when when you think of God and his wrath, and he used that, say, why was he such a wrathful God? I'll tell you why. All he was doing was trying to drive people to repent. And that was his way of of getting them to repent of their evil ways and their evil doing so that they would turn to God. And how did the people respond to God's word, class? How did they respond? What did they do? What did you say? They believed. Put that in your handout. They believed God. How do you know that? Verse 5. There's the answer. So the people of Nineveh believed God. Folks, When you don't know what to do, believe God. When you do know what to do, believe God. Everybody wants the answers. Everybody wants the mystical ball. Everybody wants the wand. Everybody wants the magical thing to fix all the problems I have. Can I tell you what the problem you have is? You don't believe. You don't believe. The people of Nineveh just believed. In your handout, they believed God and they cried out to God. In prayer. And that's what it says in verses 8 and 9. They just prayed out to God. Putting on sackcloth and ashes. It, 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 was, a, it was a humbling thing that they did in those days. And, and it was to repent and it was to show we are humble and broken about our sinful condition. And God, we recognize who you are and we repent. In your handout, what was the result of their prayers and repentance? God changed his mind, and what did he say he would do unto them? Whatever he said he was going to do unto them and destroy them, the Bible is very clear in verse 10. He says, and he did it not. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for that, that he did it not. What a wonderful story. In your handout, write this in. 1 Chronicles 21. 1 Chronicles 21. Go there. 1 Chronicles 21, verses 14 through 17. That's between 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles. Okay, 1 Chronicles 21, 14 through 17. David had sinned against God, and now God is sending judgment here.
Folks, are you beginning to see the picture? Do you believe that God... Do you believe that God responds to people's prayer? Amen? And do you believe that prayer is, is life impacting? Amen? Do you believe that? I do. And I don't know anybody who can ignore or disagree God's word and say, I don't believe it. Well, I've given you 15,000 illustrations already. I mean, there's so much scripture in the last few weeks of this study. There's no way you can leave here and, and not be be sure and leave as a doubter. Listen, don't do that. Be like the people of Nineveh, just believe. But believe because you're believing the truth and you see it. And, uh, you know, I've heard people say, well, you know, seeing is believing and uh, or believing is not seeing or whatever. And, you know, I, I don't understand all that stuff. But the bottom line is, is that God's given his word so we can trust him. And so I can believe him. He's written his word and given us his, in, his infallible God breathed word, as the Bible says. This is his word to us. He's put it in black and white. It's clear for us to see if we'll just get in it and read it. And when he, when he does that, he'll reveal the truth to us as we're in his word. And so 14, look at that, verse 14. So the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel. That's a big word. The word pestilence is just a, it's a contagious disease. <laughs> Yay. It was highly contagious. Man, it, 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 uh, when it started, man, it wreaked havoc when God used that. God used famines, God used diseases, and you ought to sometime look up the word um, diseases or look up the different types of diseases that God used. Whoo, bad, bad. This type of disease or this pestilence uh, could have been a, a type that was a bruise um, up under the skin. That, that would come up and they would put sores all over your body and uh, bruises, yet it wouldn't break the skin. Uh, it would be like somebody uh, beating you and hitting you and putting bruises all over your body and it just coming to the surface like kind of like a hematoma. Is that right? Is that what a hematoma is? I can't remember now. It's been so long since I've been in the medical field. But those kind of things, but they'd be all over your body. And, now, and, and it's contagious. Not just you, but if I get around you, then all of a sudden I get it. And that's weird, man. But God did those things to turn people to himself. And so that's what that word means, okay? And upon Israel, and there fell of Israel 70,000 men. Woo! That's a big outbreak, man. That's a whole city wiped out. Now look at verse 15. And God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it. And he was destroying. The Lord beheld, and he repented him of the evil. And said to the angel that destroyed, It is enough. Stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. Continue on, verse 16. And David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord stand between the heaven and the earth. And then the Bible goes on to say, Having drawn a sword in his hand, stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders of Israel, who were clothed in sackcloth, you see that again, fell upon their faces. And David said unto God, It is not I that commanded the people to be numbered. Even I, it is that have sinned and done evil indeed. But as for these sheep, what have they done? Isn't that precious? Don't pour it out on those people. It was my fault. I did this. I did the sinning. Don't pour it out on them, God. Look how precious that is. And then look what he says. Let thine hand, I pray thee, O Lord be my God, be on me and on my father's house, but not on the people that they should be plagued. Man, isn't that something? Boy, that's a good story. I, these are just awesome stuff. And if you don't read this or if you're not in your Bible, look what you're missing. This is good stuff. This is cool stuff. And, uh, well, not cool to the people who had it all done to them, right? But, you know, it's amazing that in your handout, God sends an angel to destroy Jerusalem. We saw that. This was God's decision. But in the midst of carrying out that decision, he looks to the angel and he stops the angel. He changes his mind and he says to the angel, that's enough. That's enough. Why did God do this? Why did God do respond this way well according to verse 15 the bible says those three words the lord beheld what did god behold 
What did God see that made him stop the angel from carrying out his orders? I'll tell you what. Look at verse 16 and 17. At the end of verse 16, it says, Then David and the elders of Israel, who were clothed in sackcloth, fell upon their faces. They were on their faces. They were clothing themselves in sackcloth and ashes. They were repenting of their evil doing. They were recognizing, God, you're right, we're wrong. Give us mercy, not judgment. And then verse 17, and then we read this, and David said to God, It is not I that commanded these people to be numbered. Even I, it is that have sinned. You know what's good for us? Is to always acknowledge our sin. And to always and to never shift blame. To never put responsibility on someone else. Never to put it on anyone else. That, that well, they did this and that calls me. No, no, no. Just like David, he says, it's not anybody's fault but mine. And in your handout, I want you to write this in. God saw David and the elders of Israel on their knees pray. Why did God respond the way he did? Why did he turn away? And as the Bible says, he beheld. Why did he behold that angel and tell him, that's enough, that's enough? Because he looked and he saw the elders of Israel and he saw David on their knees and praying, on their knees praying, and it moved the heart of God. And sometimes we think God doesn't hear us. Sometimes we think God doesn't care. Sometimes we think God doesn't respond to my little prayers. My prayers don't make a difference. I want you to know that your prayers make a difference just like they did in the days of Hezekiah, just like they did in the days of Moses, just like they did in the days of, of, of David, and just like they did in the days of Ezekiel. Write that in your handout. Ezekiel 22, verses 30 and 31. Ezekiel, that's in the latter part of your... Old Testament, Ezekiel 22, boy look at these powerful two verses, I'll wait for you to get there, Ezekiel 22, Ezekiel 22. If you're there, say amen. Okay, if you're not there, say amen. I'll wait on you. You got it? You okay? All right. If not, look with your neighbor. Okay. Look at verse 30. Boy, look at this. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it. Oh, but look at these last four words. But I found none. Therefore have I poured out mine indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. Woo! He's not happy. He's not happy. Ezekiel was captive in Babylon who prophesied of Jerusalem's total destruction here. He, now, now think about this. He's prophesying their total destruction and is right here in the middle of it. And in your handout, what is God saying in this sobering passage? He is saying this. While my justice demanded judgment, my love desired forgiveness. Man, that is good stuff right there. My justice demanded judgment. I want justice done. I'm so glad that we're not God. We wouldn't be as forgiving as God, and we aren't sometimes. But His love desired forgiveness. 
people think, oh, he's the God of judgment. He's the God of... He's just waiting around the corner to zap people. No, 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 he's not. One day he will come as judge. And he's been forewarning and foretelling of that day and just begging people, come, come and be healed. Come and find my mercy. Come and find my grace. I'm a loving God. I want to pour out my mercy and not my wrath. But if he's a holy and righteous God, he can't just be a loving God. He has to be a wrathful God to be a holy God. If he doesn't pour out his wrath someday, if he doesn't pour out his wrath someday, then my friend, he is not a holy God. And so therefore, he has to pour out his wrath and his judgment. But here, in Ezekiel, he desired forgiveness or, or he desired reconciliation with them. Had God been able to find a man among the people of the land, in verse 29, to simply seek his face and stand in the gap in prayer, God could have spared this city. He would have allowed mercy to be shown. But in your handout, write this in. God needed a man. God said in verse 29 and verse 30, he says, I sought for a man. I'm looking for one. I just want one. But there was no man to intercede for this city. Can you imagine that? There's not anybody in Martinsville who will intercede for the people and pray before God and ask his, God, his wrath to be spared that men and women and children might be saved. Can you imagine that? All of Martinsville, boom, gone. And then we find out in the record books of history that God asked for a man to stand in the gap. God asked for a man to make up the hedge. And then his last statement would be, but I found none. Can I tell you why God's judgment isn't being poured out today? It's because he is just waiting and he's just postponing his judgment in order that more men and more women and more boys and girls might come unto him. That's why. I thank God for that. Boy, I thank God for that. Why? Because there may be just one more. There may be just one more. What does this passage teach us in your handout? Many times there are things that God could do and would do. But he will not do. Because there is no man to stand in the gap before him. pretty amazing i want you to know that your prayers make a difference you praying for the leaders of this church you praying for this church you praying for lost souls that come to this church you pray for for the teachers you pray for the deacons you pray for the ushers you pray for each and every person of this church i want you to know it makes a difference why because we want to be the people that will stand in the gap we want to make up the hedge why in order that people will be saved we want to do all that we can that folks will be saved and come to know Jesus Christ. Go to Philippians chapter 1 very quickly. Because I have something I want to show you. I want to get to that as well. Philippians chapter 1, look at verse 19. Philippians chapter 1 verse 19. Here the Apostle Paul, he, he was in prison. But he was released from prison. He was uh, released uh, after his first imprisonment. And verse 19 says, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation. That doesn't mean uh, salvation uh, as in him getting saved and, and, and getting eternal life. This means rescued. Through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Here Paul knows and, and believes, I am going to be rescued from my imprisonment because of your prayers. Go to Philemon 22. And in the Bible here, Philemon does not have any chapters, just has 25 verses. And so Philemon 22, 
you look at that verse with me, it says, But withal prepare me also a lodging. For I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. Paul was in prison when he wrote those letters. Paul was in prison and he wrote to these people. And he wrote to them and told them, the believers here. And he said, listen, prepare, get a room ready. Change the sheets, fluff the pillow. I'm on my way. Why? Because I believe that through your prayers, I'm going to be released. Isn't that something? Boy, Apostle Paul believed his prayers worked. And I want you to know, I believe our prayers work. And in your handout, according to Paul, why was he released? It was through the prayers of the saints. It was through the prayers of the saints. Does God need our prayers? Yes. According to the Bible, he does. God made a choice at his will. God made a choice of his will at creation to work on the earth. And he used humans. He used Adam. He used men and women to, as his instrumentality. He used them as inter, instruments to bid his will. So firm was God's decision that when it came to provide a redemption plan... For sinful mankind, God himself was made in the likeness of men. We've studied that out, how precious that is. Your prayers are vital to the accomplishment of God's will on this earth. Go to Revelation chapter 5. We're going to quickly look up three verses and then we're done. Revelation chapter 5, look at verse 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb. Keep turning there because we'll read it again having every one of them harps and gold vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Woo! Man, that is something right there. I'll read it again. It's just so good. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four, and twenty elders fell down before the harps, or before the lamb, excuse me, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And now look at chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8. And let's read verses 3 through 5. Okay, you there? Say amen. Okay. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer. There was given unto him much incense. And he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne, and the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes. Here we are mind. This is mind-boggling to me. And there's such a vivid uh, depiction uh, of the throne room of heaven and how essential the, the prayers of the saints are. I'm so thankful that even God himself collects and keeps a record of all your prayers. There hasn't been anything you've ever told God and spoken to God about that he doesn't have. Do you know what? I still have some love notes of my wife that she wrote me from high school. I do. I still do. I'm not going to share them with you, though. Because they're special and they're just for me. Now, they're a little corny because most teenagers are. When they write that kind of stuff, sorry. But it is. It's a little weird. But you know what? It's precious to me. Why have you, hold, why have you held on to him for so many years? Because I love her. Why have you held on him for so long? Because they were just for me. It was her way of communicating with me. And that's how dear our prayers are to God. That he keeps record of every one of them. That's it's amazing. And they're offered up to God? Saint, listen to me. Your prayers make a difference. They really do. Sometimes I know you feel like when you pray that they just hit the ceiling and bounce right back down. But they don't. Christian, as Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ce ceasing. Like Epaphras, 
I know some people pronounce it uh, Epaphras, but, but it, it's Epaphras who labored fervently in prayer. Satan will try desperately to convince you that your prayers have no impact and that they make no eternal difference. But let me end this verse, this lesson with this one verse. Look at it in your handout, James 5, 16. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The effectual fervent, glowing hot, zealous, on fire prayer life of a saint of God, a righteous person. Can I tell you something? Availeth much. Is your prayer life hot? <laughs> is your prayer life zealous? I mean, is it on fire? If it's not, it should be. Because your prayer life makes a difference in the lives of others and it makes a life impact according to God's word. Your prayers do make a difference. Next Wednesday night, I'm going to teach a lesson from this series on prayer entitled, I Prayed in Faith, What Happened? Now, you may be here tonight and you say, well, I... I um, I, uh, can you go show Donnie that if he's in here? Um, I did what that TV preacher told me to do, and I didn't get any money. I did what that preacher told me to do on TV, and I, I wasn't healed. I still, I, I, I still have, you know, I, I still have a, a, a stones. You know, I still have stones. And, and I, I still have aches in my joints. I did with I, I believed by faith and I sowed a seed and, and I did all that he told me to do. How come nothing happened? Well, I'm going to answer that. And I'm going to answer that very clearly through Scripture that people believe, well, if I just pray a magical prayer, God's going to do, God's going to, God has to obey that. And so I want you to know that that there are certain things that people pray that were written for them to pray. You know, for the nation of Israel, God told the nation of Israel, listen, whatever you give away, whatever you sell, sell whatever you're persecuted for, wh whatever you're laughed at, whatever, whatever you are, is taken from you, Come, come when the kingdom is established, when I establish the kingdom for you again, when I place that on earth, I'm going to give you a hundredfold. I'm going to restore that unto you. And a lot of preachers and teachers teach that, that if you'll just do that, and if you'll just pray those prayers, that that's what God will do for you. But my friend, you are not Israel. That wasn't promised to you. And so you can pray those prayers until you pass out. But God is not going to respond to those prayers if you pray that. Say, why not? Well, I'll tell you why those guys do it. Number one, they do it because they get very wealthy by doing it. Now, let me tell you something. That is a money-making business. Paul warned of them that will shall make merchandise of you. And I want you to know that religion is a money-making business. And when you sell religion, let me tell you something. People get rich, but people get rich at the cost of your bank account. Preach it. And that's the truth. And people get hooked and do and lured into all this stuff. Well, how come my stuff don't work? That preacher prayed and he, he's bragging about his $1,200 suit. And he got a jet to fly around. And he wants a billion dollars to reach a billion people. Why is everything working out for him? I don't know why everything's working out for him. But I can tell you why it ain't working out for you. There ain't but one reason why it's working out for him. Because it's people like us that chunk him money. That's why it's working out so well for him. He ain't got no problem making his bills. And so we got to be very careful. And when we don't do what 2 Timothy 2, 15 says, the Awana verse. When we fail to rightly divide the word of truth, you are just, you can believe, people believe anything. But I want to rightly divide that and show you in God's word Hey, I prayed in faith. What happened? Why, you know, what's the deal, man? Y'all believe in prayer? I did what you said. And why didn't it work? Well, we're going to go through that. 
And there's a lot of questions I want to answer for you. But I don't want to do it just from my point of view. I want to show you in God's word why it's true. And so I hope you'll be back. And you don't want to miss any of those. Okay? Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for the word of God. And